Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. What? Ten ounces. I almost said nine. I was off an inch or off an ounce. I was ten minutes late when I made the announcement Wednesday and I was a half an inch off. So it's Little Alexander was born Monday at 10.28 a.m. He was uh, 19 and a half inches and 6 pounds, 10 ounces. So praise the Lord. We have new life and more life's coming, which is exciting. Uh, praise the Lord. God is so good. How many people have come for God's Word today? Have you come for the Word? Well, I pray that you have. And we're going to get serious about God uh, here today as we look at... Uh, into uh, his word and the, the the theme that I gave this the theme for sanctity of life this year was from the womb and so I kind of added a little bit to their theme to make the full text that we're going to look at today uh, more effective and that is from the womb to the cross from the womb to the cross and of course we are going to be looking at even the life of Jesus Christ who of course was born of a virgin born in Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph and we're going to see where life and one life can change the world. You never know. One of these little kiddos may very well be the next governor. Maybe our next pastor. Maybe, you know, our next president. Maybe the next school teacher. Maybe, I mean, the any. I mean, one child. One child and, and, and is so special. And just so you guys remember, you at one point or another were a little baby. You were that special one. That, that your parents, whether they raised you or not, they, they brought you to term and gave life to you, okay? And therefore, God has blessed your life, and God is doing some wonderful things. And as we learned, he is Emmanuel, God, with us, and he is here, and he desperately wants to do great things uh, for you. Church, children, and life is special. And in 2016, life is in great jeopardy in all aspects. Life is in jeopardy from the point where, you know, with, with abortion and other issues that go down to a life being mistreated, the amount of abuse that's going on in our country, uh, life even for our seniors is, is so, a life is not cherished as it once was. Well, church, let me just say, that's not something that's unprecedented. When Jesus was born of a virgin 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, he came at a very difficult time where life was not cherished uh, to, to a great extent under the Roman Empire. And certainly not for a Jew and certainly not for Jesus Christ. We're going to look into Isaiah's uh, book here, the book of Isaiah from chapter 49, and we're going to examine where God has great plans for every person who's been conceived in their mother's womb all the way to their death. And in Jesus' case, of course, and in our case too, the power of his resurrection. Church, I pray as Christians in 2016, we will declare life as something that's special. I pray that you are praying already about whose name you will check when you go to vote on November the 8th of this year. I'm praying that you are taking life as a serious matter when it comes to how you, uh, how you conduct yourself. And lastly, I'm praying that you know and understand that every life is special. Church, we cannot say, well, I, that baby was born in wedlock, or that baby, uh, their mother abandoned them, or that baby, blah, blah, blah. Church, one of the things as a student of history, that during the 19th century in America, uh, during the Reconstruction period where you had some negativity and B words and other words that I care not even to say of children who were born uh, without a father or children who were abandoned or an orphan or anything like that. Let me just say here today, every child is special. Amen. Yes. Every child. They may have illegitimate parents or un uncertain who their parents are, but they're still special. Church, we cannot, we cannot label or set aside and put children even on different playing fields. Well, pastor, that child's not very bright. They're still special. They're created by God. 
Oh, pastor, that, that is your daughter. That's, yeah. What makes my daughter any different from anybody else's little girl? Church, all children are special. And that's what the Bible duplicates over and over and over and over again. There's nothing we can do about what the world is doing other than pray for them and ask God to do a great move of his spirit. But we can certainly do something about our attitude about life. We can certainly carry our weight and, and do our part in declaring that God is a creator of life and that God is awesome. And that's, that's so, so perfectly portrayed in the life of Jesus Christ. That God cares about every single person and every person. You know what? Jesus went to the cross for every one of us. We can do something about that. We can do something about when it, when it comes to taking a stand. Now, not to belittle someone, this idea of what many Christians are doing, bombing abortion clinics and doing all this stuff, that's not the way to handle it. Two wrongs don't make a right. Church, that's not the way to go. We must pray that we can defend God's word and that he will honor us and bring a great revival to America. Because the one thing I used to think, well, well, let's just teach abstinence. Let's just, you know, get our young people, you know, getting away from the, you know, the unwanted pregnancies and all this other stuff, you know, and that's going to help. And all that's important. That's great. But church, you know where the real problem is? The real problem is we're separated from God. The real problem is our heart is in the wrong place. The real problem is we're, we're calling some special and others not so special. As a school teacher, I see it all the time. As, a, uh, as, as one that's worked with kids, I saw it in my own life with my own niece who was born out of wedlock. I saw that firsthand as a 13-year-old boy. I know what's going on out in the world. But we can make a change with God's help. We can certainly impact the River Valley for such a time as this. As you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word I hear today from Isaiah chapter 49. And we're going to be reading the first six verses. If you do not have a Bible or cannot find it in your Bible, it'll be on the screen for you. And, uh, and Or if you cannot see the screen, just listen with your ears. God's Word is meant to be heard. Isaiah 49, beginning with the first verse, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. And made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he has said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord. And my work with my God. And now the Lord says who formed me from the womb to be his servant. To bring Jacob back to him. So that Israel gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. And my God shall be my strength. Indeed he says it is too small a thing that you should be my serpent. To raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the pre preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seen. Church, a lot of people in the last 20 chapters or so of Isaiah really don't understand most of the time what's going on, which is unfortunate because Isaiah is like a mini Bible. Isaiah has 66 chapters. There are 66 books in the Bible. The first 39 chapters deal with the law and prophecy, which is equivalent to the Old Testament. The second 27 chapters deal with salvation through grace that's found in the branch, Jesus Christ, which, of course, there's 27 books of the New Testament. Isaiah is pretty amazing. And a lot of people, though, including some of the On the Right to Life and the uh, the Sanctity of Life websites and things, people had a lot of questions about this context because the only part that they were Sanctity of Life was promoting was from the womb. And then people went and they read this passage of Scripture, but they had no idea what the context is about. And so I'm praying that pastors all over America today are, are bringing the context. I'm praying that they themselves understand the context. 
that they can bring this because this has to deal with. This is one of over the 800 references to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament of what he would come and what he would do. We also have to remember with Isaiah, it is Isaiah as we learned at Christmas time. It is Isaiah who gives us the virgin birth prophecy. It is Isaiah that tells us that his name shall be called Emmanuel. When I heard that interpretation today and I said, Lord, you're right on it this morning. Lord, this is you all together as we look and tour through the book of Isaiah. You know that God is on the scene. And as Pastor Vince said, God is already here. Isn't it great to be in his presence? Praise the Lord. In church, with, with Isaiah, it's important to note that, that not only would the Messiah be called Emmanuel and be born of a virgin, but however, it would be through human life that Jesus would be, un, would be unlike any other deity. Whether you're dealing with Zeus or whether you're dealing with Suna or Diana or any other German god, Greek god, you know, Baal, any of them, Jesus would come through the form of a human being. And he would come through the form just like each and every one of us through the womb. Now, of course, Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He was there at creation, of course, and that type of thing. But when it came to his purpose in life, when it came to his mission, he would come the same way each and every one of us did, and that is through the womb. Maybe you have no relationship with your birth mother. My wife's birth mother died when she was just a baby, but I pray to see her when I get to heaven because I'm going to say thank you, May. Thank you, May, for carrying her to term. Hannah is named after my mother-in-law that I've never met. I pray to meet her one day where I'll be able to say what all the doctors wanted her to abort my wife. She carried that baby to term, praise the Lord. And that she, you know, is living and fulfilling that purpose that God has for her. Praise be to God. Well, church, Jesus, let's join his club today from the womb. But unlike Jesus, we can, of course, go to the cross. That was set aside for him because he is God. And only the, he is the only blameless one, the only perfect one that's ever breathed on this earth. Okay, the only walk this earth. And so Jesus, he went from the womb all the way to the cross. Why? Because he loves us. Church, what is our mission? Every one of us should be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every one of us should be declaring that God loves that child, loves that person, loves that senior citizen, loves that individual, no matter what their age is, and that the Father's will is that none should perish, but all shall come to everlasting life. And church, this is important here, and that's why I just wanted to give that little introduction there of a little bit of, of a preface so that you would have a firm foundation when it came to the prophecy of Isaiah. But Isaiah also gives us a point of what was going on historically during this time and what would happen later. And we're going to find that with, with Jacob or Israel, that they would go through a period of 2,800 years of rebellion. And God was, through Jesus Christ, going to save his people. How was God going to do this? He was going to send his son to be born of a virgin and to be born through the womb, to be born in a manger in a little town of Bethlehem. Why? Not only to save the Gentiles, the people of Jacob, Israel, but also to save the Gentiles. He's saving the Jews. He's saving the Gentiles. Praise be to God. And that's what's so important. Let's break these verses down here this morning. Verse number one of Isaiah chapter 49 we're going to hear a conversation of God speaking to Isaiah. And this is God speaking. And he says, oh, listen, O oh coastlands to me and take heed, you peoples from afar. I pray here today you'll listen up. I pray here today you're, you've got the cotton out of your ears. Patriots game's over, so you have nothing to worry about. Who cares about the Panthers and the Seahawks? You know, who cares about the Broncos and the Steelers? Certainly don't care about the Steelers. You know, so let's just concentrate in on God's word here today. All right? And so listen here, God says to Isaiah, and as he's speaking to all the people of Israel, listen, O coastlands, to me. God is wanting us to listen to him here today. God was speaking at 10 o'clock when the service opened. God is still speaking now. He's, he's transitioned from tongues and interpretation, one of the gifts of the Spirit. To, he's transitioned from that to a time of worship, to a time of prayer. He's transitioned through that to a, a presentation of sanctity of life. And now he's transitioning to Isaiah 49. And even though this is 2,900 years old, it's still alive, praise the Lord. Nobody agrees with that? His word's still alive. I pray we'll listen to him here today. We will, And God says, listen to me. 
And take heed, you peoples, from afar. Maybe you're here today and you're not walking very closely with God. Maybe you're spiritually afar from Him. Or maybe, you know, obviously I don't think there's any Jew here, so as far as the lineage of a human being, we're all afar from, from we are adopted in as Gentiles, praise the Lord. But I, what I, God is saying to Isaiah is that every person would listen to him. Why did God want every person to listen to him? Because he had something important to say. Church, God has something important for us to hear today, and that is he is a God of life. He is a God of life, praise the Lord. You know, whether you're big or small, young or old, it doesn't matter. Have many talents, a lot of talent, uh, no talent. You know, you got to have some talent, praise the Lord. You know, whatever, God has great reason for every person that is breathing today and who has ever breathed, praise the Lord, because he is a God of life. And God's wanting us to listen to him. And he says here, the Lord has called me. You, you heard me mention earlier where God's having a conversation with us. But Jesus is the one having a conversation with Isaiah. Let's break this verse down a little bit more carefully because maybe you didn't catch that earlier. And maybe you didn't catch it when I read it and we stood for the reading of God's word. The Lord has called me. If you have a capitalized version of the Bible, the Lord is capitalized and me is capitalized. Who is the Lord, our Father in heaven? Who is the me? Jesus Christ. Church, Jesus, he had conversations with many of the patriarchs of faith. Jesus, you know, was not just, he just didn't come out of nowhere at the virgin birth upon conception. I should say, you know, with the Holy Spirit into Mary's womb. You know, Jesus, and we just saw that video, and, and Marsha's uh, speaking about how that all happens. Felt like you were in science class, didn't it? It felt like that to me, praise the Lord, you know, that we were in science class today, you know, and we were all learning about how God put this piece together. But that's exactly what happened. But guess what? The sperm didn't come from a man. The sperm came from the Holy Spirit, praise the Lord. And he is conceived by the Holy Spirit into Mary's womb. But it says here, the Lord has called me from the womb. Now you're looking at this and you're saying, well, well, Lord, or well, what does this mean, Lord? Well, this tells us that the Messiah, the one that is going to save Jacob, the one that is going to restore the people of Israel, it's going to come through a human birth. It's going to come just like everyone else, praise the Lord. And he is going to be born. And this is the Father's plan. This is the Father's will. And it is the Lord, the Father, who has called Jesus from the womb. And what's happened? People wonder, you know, why did it take, you know, all the way from Adam and Eve's sin, you know, roughly, let's just say for argument's sake, 4,000 years to Jesus being born. Well, we're going to find out. Jesus is going to tell us. The Father was just simply hiding him till it was the perfect time. Why hasn't Jesus Christ returned yet? Because the Father is waiting for his perfect time. And then he's going to say, son, go get my children. Well, we have to grasp and understand the will of the Father, and Jesus certainly did. Even when he was on this earth, he would pray, Father, not my will, but your will be done. But the Lord says, the Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix, which also means womb, of my mother. He has made mention of my name. Jesus is all-knowing. Jesus is, is certainly God without a shadow of a doubt. And here Jesus is just emphasizing to Isaiah, the one who prophesied of his virgin birth, the one who prophesied his name shall be called Emmanuel. You know, Jesus is, and his prayer with Isaiah, and Isaiah is recording it here for us, is declaring once again that from the matrix, matrix of, or of the womb of my mother, he has made mention of my name. Well, you say, what does that mean? It means Emmanuel. What does that mean? Fulfillment. Jesus rubber stamping what Isaiah had already said roughly 25 years earlier when he gave the virgin birth prophecy. Jesus is saying, yes, this is correct. Yes, this is what uh, is going to happen. This is going to fall right into place. Yes, this is the bottom line. And here, the Lord, whose name is going to be made mention, which of course is Emmanuel. And guess what? That's exactly what Mary and Joseph call their son. Emmanuel. From the womb, Jesus would be brought forth into this world. Verse number two, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. The Father has made my mouth, Jesus, like a sharp sword. Do you know something, church? There's something about the Word of God. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. There's something about God's Word that just either brings you to life or puts you to death. There's power in the Word of God. 
There's power in that word. And that's something that we've got to gotten away from as Christians the last 43 years is gotten away from the word of God. Now we don't even care what it says. We don't we don't even want to hear. Look at, you know, on this football weekend, you know, look at Tim Tebow. You know, you see all that he's been through. He's out of the NFL, most likely because of his faith. You know, and, and people belittle him because he shares his faith, you know, and all this other stuff. And he's being thrown under the bus. But we're praising some dude that's living like a woman. And that's welcomed in society. But as soon as he mentions his faith, he gets thrown under the bus. I mean, this is, this is real stuff. We don't even, we don't even uh, care anymore, certainly, you know, about God's word. And if, and if Christians try to speak out, well, you're a bigot, you're filled with hate. Well, church, let me just say this. This is what God spoke in my heart because the, 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 our, our students here at PAGCA, we just finished a unit on persecution. Guess what? If you're going to speak out for God, be prepared to be persecuted. And the arena that you're going to be tested first is life. It's coming, church. It is coming to America. Remember that movie in the 80s? Late 80s, I think it was. Coming to America. Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall. Well, church, coming to America today is an attack, and life is the centerpiece of it. The president, he's bringing forth several executive orders, trying to overturn while Congress is out of session, you know, the, the partial birth abortion and giving extra funding to Planned Parenthood. And you just had where Kansas just voted in their state house to say, Mr. President, you can't do that. Just because you give us money for Planned Parenthood doesn't mean we have to take it. Because I don't know if you guys know this or not, but when a federal government gives money to an agency that's in various states, it goes into the, it goes into the treasury of the state government and then the state issues it. And Kansas said, oh, no, we're not doing that. States starting to speak up. Why? Because of the pressure of the church. Well, church, I pray that we will do the same, you know, here, you know, in the state of Maine, which is one of the bluest states in the country, by the way. If you didn't know that, we live in one of the bluest states next to Massachusetts and Oregon. It doesn't get much bluer than Maine. You say, Pastor, well, I live in rural Maine. We're conservative up here. Yeah, but most of the people live in Portland. Okay, so we're a very blue state, and so is Augusta. But here is, it's important to note here, church, that Jesus... As he is going to come from the womb, his mother's womb, for a purpose. And that is to bring forth a mouth of a sharp sword. There's something powerful about not only the spoken word of God, but the written word of God. And here is Jesus speaking. You say, Pastor, but it's not in the New Testament. That doesn't mean it's not Jesus. Jesus had a conversation, as I said, over 800 of them in the Old Testament. We've been reading Daniel. Daniel. I mean, Jesus is, is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. In the shadow of his hand he has hidden me and made me like a polished shaft. In his quiver he has hidden me. Here it's the, Jesus says, you know, that, that he is being hidden by his Father. He, he is declaring that, yes, this is going to happen in the future when it is my appointed time to enter the planet Earth through the virgin birth prophecy. Born in Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph, the seed of David. All those things that Isaiah had declared earlier in his life. And here's Jesus explaining that it's just simply the fact that his father has hidden him. It is his father's will, and Jesus is obedient to his father's will. And, he is, and Jesus is being polished. Jesus is, is being obedient. Can you can think about it, church, when Jesus was born? Is there ever a place in the life of Jesus Christ in the Gospels where he wasn't prepared? Or he was caught off guard? Or he was sitting there shocked? Wondering what's going on, what's happening. I can't believe this is happening today. I can't. That's not how Jesus rolled. Jesus was polished. He was ready to speak. He was never caught with his hand in the cookie jar. Even when the apostle, I'm sorry, the the uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees and even the the disciples themselves tried to you know ask questions, maybe to catch Jesus off guard, or maybe Satan himself in Matthew chapter four, you know, to try to get Jesus back against the corner. Jesus was well polished in his word. Why? Because the Father had hidden him for many years until he was ready. Well, church, guess what? Jesus is getting ready to return. This time, though, he's not coming through a womb. The eastern sky is going to part, and he's coming in the clouds. Things are a little different with his first advent and his second advent. The thing that is similar, though, is as Jesus came at that first advent through the womb with a purpose. I pray here today that you want God to polish you. 
You say, Pastor, how can he do that? How can he polish me? How can he prune me? Become a student of the Word? Have a desire to, for you and your kids and your family to be in Sunday school so that you can know the Word? You know, have a desire to get alone with God and let Him speak to you through His Word? He can polish you. Some people, it's getting to be where not only prayer doesn't shake them much, nor does Bible study. They would rather just make an appointment. Well, church, it'd be much easier for the pastor and a teacher of God's Word to teach 20 people rather than to make 20 one-hour appointments to teach the same lesson to, the same, to different people. Why not come together and study His Word? Well, here... Jesus is letting us know that he has been hidden. It is not his time yet. Jesus was the master of that, by the way, during his life on the earth. He would say, it is not my time yet to die. And he would sneak out and they wouldn't find him. But then when he said, it's time, the disciples were too tired. They couldn't stay awake. Verse number three. Shifting, if you see the quotation marks there, we're shifting to uh, Isaiah now. And he said to me here Jesus said to Isaiah you are my servant O Israel in whom I will be glorified it's important to note that not only did the father know his servant Jesus Christ but Jesus Christ knew his servant which is Isaiah does Jesus know you today as his servant well I go to church I don't mean you're a servant of the Lord Jesus said I did not come to be served but to serve we heard John Waller Tuesday night saying, worship while I wait. I will serve you while I wait. Some of us, when we get into a firestorm of life, we stop worshiping, we stop serving because we believe God's given up on us. Jesus actually promised that there would be trial and tribulation, not Peter Pan. And everything just fall into place. And you know, you have everything you've ever wanted, driving a nice car, living in a nice house. As I said just a moment ago, persecution is going to come. And the church is going to have a choice. Either face it or just duck and run. I pray we face it. God in the book of Acts and in any other place throughout history, every time persecution came, the church grew. Are we ready for that in America? Well, here, here is, here is a, the Lord speaking to Isaiah. You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Will God be glorified in our life? Now Israel, God would not be glorified in Israel's life until after World War II with Adolf Hitler when the Jews repented for the sins of their fathers and God began blessing them again because they turned away from idolatry. But church here, God would be glorified because that's what he promised Abraham. That's what he promised Isaac. That's what he promised Jacob. And I know that I pray here today that God will also be glorified in your life. I love that when we sing that song, In My Life, Be Glorified. Well, is he being glorified today? Is he be glorified in the secret place of, of your life? As we studied a couple weeks ago from Psalm 91. I will dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Will you trust in him? Will he be glorified in your life? Church, I love the fact where here the Lord tells Isaiah, I will be glorified, which means it is a promise. You can take it to the bank. I believe, church, that those that really love Jesus Christ and his church that is faithful, they will be glorified. God will be glorified in that house because of their faithfulness. And I pray we will be faithful. I pray that we will, God will be glorified here, praise the Lord. God's name will be high and lifted up. You say, Pastor, why is that important for today? Because if we don't get behind life, we will not be glorified. Why? Because life is important to God. Life used to be important to this country. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now we have all these scientific terms. When is a baby a baby? Embryo, fetus, you know, what, what term, what term, what term? Well, with God's term, it's from conception. From the womb. Praise the Lord. God is working. God is amazing. God is wonderful. God is, God is just, even when a doctor says a baby can't be conceived, guess what? A baby can be. My mother was told after I was born, you know, that, that uh, you know, you probably won't have any more children. 
I was 10 months old when my younger brother was born. Next week, he's going to be 37. We're going to be the same age for 10 months. So much for what that doctor knew. And I, my mother, when she tells the story how his name was Dr. Thomas, was completely shocked. Think about that. I was just a month old and my mother's pregnant again. Wow. Well, Doc, you said this can't, this, this has got to be a mistake, but as we just found, 95%, you know, I don't know what it was back in 1979, but, you know, and 95% and it's pretty successful that they can tell when, the, when a woman's pregnant. And sure enough, nine months later, my younger brother came along. And we were twins, basically, until we were in fourth grade. We were dressed alike and everything. I think it was Elizabeth that said that uh, uh, the little one begins to resent when they have a little brother or sister. I had no time to think about that because I was only 10 months old and here he came. My brain was over. I didn't even get to see one year old. Now, here he is. But you know what? We're best friends and we have been. Every picture you see us and we're like coffee in a cup. We're always together. Every paper I've ever written in my collegiate life and since then, he's proofread. We're, we're very close. And here Jesus said to Isaiah, his servants, I will be glorified. May God be glorified in our life and all that we do. And for, for God to be glorified, we must be a defender of life. We must be a defender of life. So again, I would seriously consider you to pray. Encourage you to pray over whose name you vote for come November the 8th. You're here and you're going to be 18 years old by that day. I pray you will register to vote. And the one thing about Maine, you can even register the day of the election. We do not have a waiting period. Even in Maine, unless you're a three-time felon, you can vote. We're the only state in the union where one or two felons can vote. As long as it's not a Class A or Class B. But every other state, if you're a felon in general, you cannot vote. But here, verse number four, then I said... Isaiah speaking, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Here Isaiah was discouraged. Here Isaiah saw his, the Israelites committing idolatry. Even the priests even were wrapped up in lewd behavior. They were getting further and further away from God. You know, here Isaiah, I'm laboring in vain. I'm laboring in vain. This is not, this is not going too good, Lord. This is not, this is not. He was doubting himself. You know, maybe you're here today and you've recently been doubting yourself. You've been recently wondering where God is. And here, you know, and as God is speaking to your heart, you come and say, Lord, I'm not getting anywhere. Lord, I'm a terrible parent. Maybe I don't deserve this child. Maybe this child would be better off somewhere else. You know, maybe you're at that place and you're, you're actually believing that you're living in vain. Isaiah was at this point today. Why? Because as he looked out, he saw everybody going the wrong way. Isaiah was broken. Isaiah had prophesied that Assyria was getting ready to conquer the Israelites, you know, and they, they, they didn't care. They were doing their own thing. And, and Isaiah was blaming himself. Like a parent, when our kids go astray, who's the first one we usually blame? Ourselves. As a pastor, when things aren't going too good, who do we blame? Ourselves. I can tell you firsthand. Am I the problem? There's so much rebellion. Am I the problem? The church, you know, numerically is growing. Am I the problem? I mean, all that kind of stuff crosses your mind. Lord, am I laboring in vain? Here's Isaiah. You get to see the human perspective of where Isaiah was at. Church, just because it, there's a book in the Bible named after God's servant, Isaiah doesn't mean he didn't have questions at times in his life. And, and Isaiah was in a place there. Isaiah was in a, Lord, I'm not, you know, he's beginning. You can sense the doubt as he's speaking to the Lord. Verse, continuing on, the last part of verse 4. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord. But then as Isaiah shared this, where he was at emotionally, he comes back to his faith. Church, will our faith drive us? Well, here Jesus, we're going to see in a moment, Jesus, you know, he, of course, at the point of when he was on the cross, you know, Father, why have you forsaken me? You, we get to see the human side of Jesus later on as he's on the cross. Lord, can this cup pass from me? Is there any other way, Lord, that this, that your will can be fulfilled? And we're going to see in a second where Jesus, 
as he's speaking of coming from the womb and Jesus is going to be the answer. What Jesus is basically saying to Isaiah is it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy for me to save both the Jew and the Gentile, but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it via the, the virgin birth through the womb. And I'm going to be just like any other human being. Church, it's not going to be an easy to be a defender of faith and be a defender of life. But Jesus never said it would be. He knows your times of discouragement. He knows you. Maybe there's somebody here that remembers 43 years ago and you're frustrated because you didn't speak out and you, you heard God speak into your heart and you sat there mute because you, like many Christians of that day, believed you don't get involved in politics. It's interesting to note that with Roe versus Wade, the woman who brought forth that case is now pro-life, strong evangelical Christian and shares her testimony everywhere she goes trying to get it overturned. God can minister to anyone. You can hear her all over the news today, speaking, trying to encourage young girls to go forth with it, even put the child for adoption. You know, do, do something, don't terminate. Which is a complete 180 degree turn from what she was saying in 1973. Yet surely my reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. Isaiah was putting his trust in the Lord. Which is exactly what Jesus would do regarding His Father. That's what we, we must do as well. Some of you I know are upset with our governor. With our president. Our governor just this week fought off a, an impeachment vote in the House. Our president, you just gave his last State of the Union address. And it was filled with a lot of promises and rhetoric, but no plan. Our governor, he's almost a lame, a lame duck governor where he's already been reelected, he has to leave in, in 2018. And you're going to see a lot of that being pushed, politically speaking. And it's real easy just to get frustrated. It's real easy to think that we're losing. There's, we're not being effective. Church, remember, worship and servanthood is not horizontal. It's vertical. What we do is for the Lord... What we represent is for Him. Just as Jesus had a sharp sword, I pray that we will too. Even if you're here and, and made past mistakes, that's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why He was born of a virgin. That's why He's Emmanuel, God with us. To give us a fresh start once we ask God to forgive us of our sin. There's nothing Jesus will not forgive us of, praise the Lord. But you must through confidence and faith say, you know what, Lord, my reward is in you. Even if it doesn't look like I'm winning, my reward is in you. Isaiah, as he's sitting there, and he's seeing all the Israelites go down the road of idolatry, including in God's house. My reward is not in whether or not these people are obedient or not. The reward is whether or not I'm faithful in you. My reward is not going to be, church, if every person sitting in every seat we have in here, 250 seats. My reward is going to be whether or not I've been faithful to his word. That's where my reward's going to be. And I've got to have confidence in that. Every one of us have to have confidence in that. Isaiah's at that place. And my work, and my work with my God. Praise the Lord. You, had to, you would have to believe as Isaiah is speaking with Jesus that this would be music to his ears. In verse number 5, and now the Lord says, this is now the Lord speaking again, who formed me from the womb to be his servants. Here is Jesus saying, Isaiah, you be faithful, but I want you to know something. I'm going to fulfill your prophecy. I'm going to fulfill what you said about me 25 years earlier. That I'm going to, I am going to be born of a virgin. My name is going to be Emmanuel. I'm going to be formed from the womb, praise the Lord, to be what? To be the Father's servant. Just like you, Isaiah, you're, this, you're his servant, and guess what? So am I. What's, that, what's Jesus saying here? He's on the same playing field as us. Jesus isn't carrying a holier-than-thou attitude. He's coming with an attitude of humility, saying, you know what? I'm on the same playing field. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be born just like uh, through the womb, just like you are, Isaiah. I'm, I'm coming to fulfill what you said, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to be the Father's servant, and my reward is going to come from him. You say, Pastor, what was his reward? The Father got him up out of the grave, didn't he? Where is Jesus right now? Sitting at the right hand of the Father. Waiting for the Father to say, Son, go get my children. 
I mean, when you start thinking about this, Jesus has had his reward too. What? He didn't stay in the grave. He got up out of the grave. Guess what? We're not going to stay on this earth. Old death, where is your sting? The reward comes from the Father. And here Jesus is saying, you know what? I'm going to be discouraged too. I'm coming from the womb. I'm going to live just like every other human being. If, if they cut me, I'm going to bleed. If I, get, if I get discouraged, I'm going to cry. Remember the shortest verse in Scripture is actually, he wept. <coughs> Amen means let it be. It's a little bit longer. He wept. When did he weep? With Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. And they did not have the faith that Jesus could bring Lazarus out of that tomb. And he wept. He was broken. He was discouraged. Jesus had human emotions just like we do. And this is important to note, church, to hear, you know what? The Lord's for me from the womb to be his servant. There's, a, there's so much here to life. So much here to, to what Jesus came to do. But Jesus didn't put himself on a different playing field. He said, Isaiah, I'm right down there with you, man. Don't quit. We're not in vain. Jesus did not die on the cross in vain. He did not. Which, when a Christian says, and falls for this Oprah Winfrey stuff, that there are other ways to heaven, that's Jesus dying in vain. Jesus did not die in vain. That is heresy. That is false teaching. Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. And the only way to the Father is through Him. He is the gatekeeper. He's the good shepherd. Nobody's sneaking in the back door. I mean, that's what life is all about. His life is not in vain. Nor was Isaiah's. And then Jesus, I love this, He gives His purpose for coming in. He says there, the second half of verse 5, to bring Jacob back to Him. Now, Jacob here, Jesus was not speaking of Jacob, Abraham's, you know, grandson. He was speaking of the nation of Israel. He was speaking of the one in which Jacob would be named Israel. He's speaking of the children of God. He's speaking of the ones that would be restored only through Jesus Christ. What does the Jews hope today? For the Messiah to be born? Oh no, he's already been born. Their hope today is just like a Gentile, to have faith in Jesus Christ. They're called Messianic Jews, praise the Lord. And here, here church, when you, when you think about it, Jesus says to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. What does Jesus address with Isaiah? He addressed the problem in the first place, which was Israel's sin. Church, what is, what is our hope today? It's still Jesus Christ, Lord, return and get us out of here. What is our hope for the lukewarm church? It's Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, Pastor, well, we have, we have our Bible open. You know, that's great. That's wonderful. But you know what, church? Jesus is the one who's going to come back to fulfill this. We can have a Bible open in every translation you can think of. That doesn't mean God's presence is going to be here. There are many churches, both Protestant and Catholic, all around the world that have beautiful pictures and beautiful Bibles in various languages. That doesn't mean God's presence is there. That doesn't mean God's presence is going to be in your house because you have a Bible open on your coffee table. Big family Bible. Remember those big old family Bibles? Huge. Well, that means I'm walking. Oh, no, it don't. That's not how it goes. In church here, Jesus and I am going to bring Israel back to my father. I, my life, my motive is going to be to reunite God, my father, with his children, the Israelites. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Jesus was going to make his father proud. Just like back when Isaiah said in verse 4, Yet surely my reward is with God, and, and my work is with God. You know, here's Jesus. He's wanting to make his father proud by fulfilling his mission from the womb. Which is what? To re in this case, it is to restore a fallen Israel. And we're going to read about the Gentiles in a second. And to restore them, which is to save them, is basically what Jesus is saying. Which actually, when, when the angels came to Mary and Joseph, what did they tell them? Your son, your child will be a son, and he shall save God's people, many of God's people, from their sin. Why did he say all? Because he knew most would not go the road of Jesus. Most would go the broad path. But Jesus would be the narrow way. Think about it here. Think about it. Jesus wanted to make his father proud. 
Isaiah wanted to make Jesus proud. And you better believe they both fulfilled their task. Now I ask you the question, are you fulfilling your end of the deal? Is G, are you, do you have a desire to, to make your Father in Heaven proud? Do you have a desire to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servants? Do you have a desire to represent Jesus Christ as a God of life in 2016? Do you have a desire to encourage those that are broken and to bring glory to the eyes of the Lord? Remember we read, you know, back in verse number three, in whom I will be glorified. And here is the glorious, bringing glorious to the eyes of Jesus Christ, bringing glory to his eye and the Father in heaven. And that my God shall be my strength. Maybe you're sitting here wondering how you're going to do this. Let God be your strength. Don't let the pastor be your strength. Let God be your strength. Jesus said, if you drink from this well, you will never thirst. You know, let your cup be overflowing. Let your joy be restored. Remember, he is God with us, Emmanuel. Let him be your strength, praise the Lord. Growing up, Darren and I, all we wanted to do, and we used to say this every day we got off the school bus. We rode bus 248. Donald Jefferson was his name. You know Mr. Jefferson? Oh, yeah. And, and he called me French fry, called my brother hamburger. Because at the time, we were always just, you know, two little fat boys is who we were, really. And we were real overweight, and we, we knew it, you know. But we were, it was good. It was all fun. We didn't get, it wasn't nothing like that. But every day we got off his bus, and we were walking into a Peel Elementary School. We would say to each other, let's go make mom and dad proud of us today. And all these years later, and we were just talking about this at Christmas. And we were sitting there, and, we, we, and I even said this at my parents' 45th anniversary, and this year they're going to have their 50th anniversary. And I was talking to them again, and even today as a 37-year-old dog, next to making my God proud, I want to make my parents proud. And how I conduct myself and how I represent them. Why? Because I want to honor their legacy by the fruit of their labor, which is us, their kids. Jesus wanted to do the same thing. He knew he knew that to bring honor to his father, the Ancient of Days, he had, to be, he had to bring glory to his name. Not something to dishonor him. Not something to contradict or to make fun of his father. He wanted to do something that was going to bring him glory in the eyes of his father. In verse number 6, indeed he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant." To raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you, I love this, as a light to the Gentiles. What's the father say? He says, son, I hear you. Isaiah, I hear you. But it's just too small, Jesus, for you to take care of the Jews. I also want you to take care of the Gentiles. Does everybody understand what's going on here? I know it's getting late. I know there's a football game, I think, in an hour. But does everybody understand what the Father's saying here? He's saying, Lord, it's too small for you just to be worried about the Jews. I want you to be worried about the Gentiles, too. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, God is a God of life. He, he doesn't just care about the children born, in, born into marriage as, as His divine will, you know, and the children that have a father and a mother. Guess what? He cares about all children, all babies that are born. He cares about everyone as a blessing. Here the Father says, Lord Jesus, it's too small for you just to be worried about the Jews. I want you to take care of the Gentiles too. Without this verse, where in the world would we be? There would be, there would be no hope. There would be the church in Ephesus when Paul says, hey, you're not just saved. You know, you're saved by God's grace alone in Jesus Christ who died not only for the Jew but for the Gentile. Here the Father is saying, you know what, son? I care about all people. Red, yellow, black, and white were all precious in his sight. Educated, uneducated, rich, poor, male, female. Know your parents, don't know your parents. Adopted or natural birth, it doesn't matter. We're all precious in the eyes of Jesus Christ. And here, the father says to the son, it's too small a thing. That you should just be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to preserve the and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. Wow, that's amazing to me. It is the gospel is the only message that'll work around the world. 
including the western foothills of Maine, the River Valley. Do you know we have people in our community that don't feel like God loves them because they're different? You know, because of this background and that background? They actually are trying to earn their way into heaven through uh, who knows what today, horse, the horoscope and Wicca and you name it, it's out here, it's everywhere. Because they don't believe God can really love them, so there must be a substitute, which means they're right into the hands of the adversary who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy them. What's our hope? Our mission field's right out here. Church, you don't have to get on a plane and go to Africa. All you got to do is go right out in this community and know there's people that don't know Jesus. And half the time you can go into the church and find out there's people that don't know Jesus. I mean, you don't have to go far. You know, it's, it's, it's important. We're going to give the invitation to Christ here in just a second. But on this Life Sunday, may you know that as Jesus was speaking to Isaiah and the Father was speaking to both of them, he's speaking to both the servant, his son Jesus, and his servant Isaiah, and says, hey, it's too small a thing just to worry about the Jews. Jesus, you're going to take care of everybody. Yeah. And aren't you glad tonight? Yeah. This church here today is for everybody. Yeah. Notice there's not names here. Notice the prestigious seats in the front. There's a whole row here. Like the old saying, Christians love to sit in the back. Why? I'll never know. It must be in the front row, Bob you. You know, want to be right up here in the right up here in the front, praise the Lord. But guess what? Every seat is special to God. Matter of fact, if you have a front row seat, you should be you should give up that seat and say, Would you like to sit here? I'll stand. Wouldn't that be a great problem to have, Chris? So many people here, they're fighting for the front. That'd be great. It'd be an awesome problem to have. Lastly, the last part, and then we'll finish here. That you would be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Why was Jesus born through his mother's womb? To save souls. To save souls. To be that sacrificial lamb. Which is why the angels are declaring even now. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. What's Jesus' purpose? To be the salvation from the father. Salvation from what? Salvation from the sin of humankind. The mess and the idolatry and the, the fornication and the adultery. And the telling lies and murdering people. And coveting things. The Ten Commandments, all that, the salvation, your only hope is through Jesus Christ. That he was born through the womb. He took the form of man for 33 years. He bled for us on the cross. Why? Because it was his Father's will. Think about it. If you're Isaiah and you're hearing this and you hear this conversation that Isaiah so wonderfully records here for us 2,900 years later. What is so special about this passage of Scripture is, is everything, the trial, the tribulation that Jesus went through, we're going, we're going to go through as well. Obviously not the crucifixion, but I'm talking about being a Christian, being a person of life. Don't expect the world to appreciate it. But that doesn't mean God's spirit will not move. That doesn't mean a revival will not come. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are persecuted for his sake. Speaking up, rather than you say, Pastor, well, I don't really do that. Oh, yeah, you do. As you're sitting at the lunch table at school, or you're sitting at the lunch table at work, and somebody's sitting there talking about, you know, uh, uh, right around you, right in the same conversation, talking about life and the lack of life, and you just sit there and don't say anything, those people around you just simply believe you must agree with them because you're not saying nothing. Rather than to take a moment and say, wait a second here. This conversation is going to stop. Or if it continues, I'm going to defend my Lord who created you in the womb. And your mother gave birth to you. And you're mean to tell me that life isn't until you breathe your first when you leave the birth canal? Well, we just learned here today that a baby's full term at 37 weeks. But I have a, I have a cousin who just turned uh, 29 years old, was born one pound and one ounce. She was born barely five months old. She now has three kids of her own. Her name is Stephanie, and she was the first student I ever tutored as a junior in high school. So don't tell me life begins. We just learned that, you know, that baby's heartbeat is, is going. 
Don't tell me what you know that we didn't just see in that video that there's life in there where we can see fingers and toes. Every every month, Mary and I had an appointment at the at the baby doctor, and I'd go in there and they would go through some of that same stuff, and, and you would see and you could hear that baby's heartbeat at such a young age. Don't tell me life hasn't begun there. You know? We can speak. We say, Pastor, I don't know. I don't know. Well, let God be your strength. Isaiah didn't know either. Isaiah was broken and he thought he was serving in vain too. But God had to encourage him and God will encourage you too. Jesus, from the womb to the cross, proved the road to life and victory. Because it's the road to salvation. Because that's the will of the Father. And that's what this context is all about. In closing, the Father didn't want Jesus just to save Israel and the Jewish people. He wanted his son to save everybody. Why? Because the Father's will is that none should perish and all shall come to everlasting life. Father. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m., worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.